I'll introduce you. Okay, hi, <laughs> welcome all. Hi, for those of you who are new um, to the museum, I'm Carol Willis, I'm the founder and director of the Skyscraper Museum. So if you found out about this talk by some other way than the museum's website or a subscription to our uh, e-newsletter, um, then you can add yourself to, to that letter on our website. And um, you may or may not know about the museum's history, which I won't go into here, but uh, I do want to mention, if you haven't had the chance to look around, you can do that after the, uh, the talk. This exhibition, Urban Fabric, which was guest curated by the scholar uh, Andrew Dolcart, an uh, uh, architectural historian at Columbia University, uh, looks at the history of the Garment District uh, in New York, the West Side Garment District between 35th Street and 40, uh, 42nd Street in uh, about 18 blocks of buildings between the avenues which are uh, utterly beige. They're not the least bit colorful buildings, although there are a few examples. Uh, so, but the color of the garment district is created by the industry of in fashion. And um, as a, a scholar of the, ar the history of the architecture, I'm particularly fascinated with this district, uh, but as someone who has also grown up um, from actually Cleveland, Ohio, with a mother who was a dress designer and who was in the fashion business, I was, uh, and whose drawings are in the first case over here, actually they're not her drawings, they're drawings that she collected in her profession as, uh, as a dress designer. I was brought up with, uh, with seasonal colors uh, and very attuned to the palette of fashion. So um, Re Reggie, hard to pronounce name, Bla Blaschek, uh, whose name really, I was just saying, should, be C it should end in CMYK rather than Czech because she has devoted um, these many years uh, to uh, uh, recent years to studying the history of color and as you see in the name of her book, The Color Revolution, it's the reason that you're here, uh, there, there is much history that undergirds the decisions about colors, the opportunities, the technologies of, of color that, um, that play out um, in our lives and that we're often unconscious of. But uh, her book, which I hope you'll take a look at if you're not familiar with it already, and it's around the corner, and you can buy a, a copy after the, the talk, is um, a, a fantastically beautifully illustrated and fascinating history uh, in a whole series of chapters that discuss, that discuss many aspects of uh, consumer production, uh, or production for consumers and uh, consumption, much of it sort of titillated and, and driven by color. Uh, but uh, she has, in honor of our exhibition tonight, I think going to focus more on the fashion industry as well as on architecture. So um, Reggie's own history is that she's an award-winning historian uh, and associate editor of the journal Design History. Uh, as of uh, February, so <laughs> in a few weeks, uh, like a couple of weeks, I guess, Reggie's going to be the professor of business history and the chair of the History of Business and Society at the University of Leeds uh, in the UK. And uh, at Leeds, she will have the opportunity to work with the British retailer, Marks and Spencer, which opened the M&S, uh, Marks and Sparks as the uh, British like to call it, uh, company archives at the university um, just last year. She, her research focuses on the history of 20th century design, fashion, business, and consumer culture. She's the author of seven books, uh, including Imagining Consu Consumers, Design and Innovation from Wedgwood to Corning, which received the Hadley Prize, the Center for Business History, uh, in 2001. And she's also published, uh, we'll, I'll mention two, two titles, uh, Producing Fashion, Commerce, Culture, and Consumers, and American Consumer Society, 1865 to 2005, from Hearth to HDTV. Uh, and that's only, uh, well, that was in 2009. So this newest book, Color Revolution, was published uh, by the MIT Press uh, last September, and it was named one of the best books, business books uh, of 2012 by the Wall Street Journal. So here's the pitch. Thank you all for coming. Is my microphone on? Can you hear me? 
Oh, that's not that's it's not projecting. You're talking. That's recording you. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Well, I'm used to standing in front of a class of 200 people, so I think a nice intimate group like this will be all set. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, can I, we're going to um, operate in a way that's a little unusual because I like to um, work from the slide numbers as opposed to going using the remote. So I'll be asking the young lady out back to give me new slides periodically. So I'd like to start with slide, slide four, please. So um, in February of 1930, the very first issue of Fortune magazine which uh, is this issue, um, published an article called Color in Industry. And in this article, Fortune magazine pointed to the, the kaleidoscopic new world that had burst forth from the ashes of World War I. The, the, the world seemed to have been dipped into a paint pot. Slide five, please. Everything from pots and pans, slide six, please to kitchen appliances, slide seven, to uh, automobiles, um, seem to be available in a bright array of colors. Now Fortune Magazine um, looked around and marveled at this uh, new wonder and discussed the reasons why this uh, all of a sudden the world was colorful. And uh, the reason it was all of a sudden American consumer goods were available in this wide range of colors was because of the a wide array of new paints, varnishes, and dyes that were emerging out of the American synthetic organic chemical industry that rose out of the ashes of World War I. I'm not going to talk about that story. <laughs> <laughs> Fortune magazine also identified another phenomenon, and it said, you've got this great chemical industry that's been born, but you've also got this whole new array of professional individuals, professional people that call themselves color stylists. It's the role of those color stylists that I'm going to talk about. Fortune um, identified um, this burst of color, came up with a great name for it, and it called it the color revolution. So the, the color revolution, that is this new, use of co this new use of color, is dependent on the new dye industry, but it's also dependent on these people, these color stylists, these color forecasters, and these color engineers. Those are the people that are what I call the color revolutionaries, and that's who I'm going to focus on in my talk tonight. Um, slide 10, please. Uh, over the last 25 years, many of you have uh, gone to through college or graduate school and you know that the new cultural history and the new social history has focused on the history of people from the bottom up. It's focused on workers, it's focused on um, uh, slaves, it's focused on uh, all kinds of individuals except the people at the top. Politics and business kind of went out of fashion for a while. What I'd like to do in my work is I actually, I am a business historian, and I'm a new, a new type of business historian. I tend not to write these dry, boring books about strategy and structure, but try to write books that look at the way in which business helped to shape the material world. And that's what this book, The Color Revolution, is about. I'm also a bit like Jack McCoy, the uh, uh, DA in Law & Order, mm -hmm. in that I like to speak for the dead who can't speak for themselves. <laughs> I believe that history is the history of people, and often it's the history of people who are no longer with us, and it's the role of, my role as a historian, to articulate their story uh, for us to understand and to learn from. So the book that I just finished asks this question, who are the color revolutionaries, and why are they important, and what was revolutionary about what they did? I want to give you um, some highlights of some of the cast of characters that are in the book, and then I'm going to segue, as Carol indicated, into a case study about color for the textile and clothing industry. But let me give you some highlights of some of these other color revolutionaries so you can get a sense of who they are. Slide 11, please. The first one that's important is this guy. His name is Harold Toll. Harold Toll was an American Impressionist painter who studied um, at, the, uh, at Pratt and um, was uh, uh, studied um, with um, William Merrick <coughs> Chase and other um, notable American Impressionists before World War I. 
Uh, during World War I, he went into um, the U.S. Army and he became the leading camouflage artist uh, working for the U.S. forces. He wrote a camouflage pamphlet and providing instruction on how to do camouflage uh, for the rest of the armed services. He did spend time on the Western Front, um, and when he came back out of the Army, he said to himself, actually he said in print, something like, in a newspaper article, he said, I learned from the war that art should not be, I don't want to create art that would hang in a dusty museum. I want to create art for the street urchin. Art should belong to everyone. So what did H. Ledyard Toll do? Slide 12, please. Toll was one of the color revolutionaries that was identified by Fortune. Toll worked for Amer Madison Avenue, first of all, in a number of ad agencies in the early 1920s where he was an illustrator. He then worked for the DuPont Company from the mid-1920s until the late 1920s. And then from the late 1920s until the early 30s, he worked for General Motors. Who's heard of Harley Earl? Harley Earl, the famous, Harley Earl was General Motors, famous um, uh, industrial designer. He's known for those big cars from the 1950s with tail fins, the extravagant cars of the 1950s that GM produced that looked like they're, they're rocket ships almost. Um, Harley Earl was probably the most preeminent automotive designer of the early 20th century. At um, H. Ledyard Toll was his sidekick. H. Ledyard Toll was the color in the art and color section at General Motors. Okay. So it was said by Fortune that in the 1920s, nobody, like Toll, could make a fat car look slimmer or a <laughs> short car look taller. So um, let's look at this, this ad from GM here in, from late 1920s. You see that this car is multicolored. And when you first look at it, you think, well, this just must be the advertisement. This is just a snazzy ad to kind of get people to look at this ad and buy the car. In fact, cars were colored in this polychrome style in the late 1920s, and it's Toll that led this movement. So he is an important color revolutionary that I discuss at length in the book. Can I have slide 14, please? Segway into architecture, since we're here in the Skyscraper Museum. Um, two other important color revolutionaries are people in this picture, which Carol may recognize some of these people. Does anybody, does anybody recognize this uh, important picture? This is a um, picture um, from the late 1920s showing a group of architects and um, interior designers, probably the most famous and important New York group of architects of the, of the 1920s. Um, here you have Leon Solon and Joseph Urban, okay? and there's a whole cast of characters here which maybe Carol can probably identify for us if yeah. we're really interested in. Ra um, well, Khan. The middle one's Raymond Hood, and uh, mm -hmm. Ra that's Khan. That's Khan. And that's Raymond Hood. Hood. And Elil Saarinen is on the right hand side. It's this one. Yeah. 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 So it's it's really these important uh, group of, of men who uh, coalesced around the architectural league and did exhibits at the Met, and this is from an exhibit that they did at the Met on architecture and interior design. Solon, everybody here is well known except Solon. Solon was a color revolutionary. Solon was, can I have the next slide please? Slide um, 15. Solon was um, based here in New York. He was art director for the American Encaustic Tiling Company, which was the largest tile company in the world. He was a master of architectural terracotta that dominated the field of designing terracotta in the 1920s and into the 1930s. This is the American Encaustic Showroom um, just near the New York Public Library. Um, and you can see what's left of the facade here. It shows you some of the brilliant color installations. This, you can get a sense of it, is the lobby of the New York office. Even though it's in black and white, you can see that he was showing off to clients how you could use color to enhance the interior. His foremost, um, his foremost um, accomplishment, however, is shown in slide 16. And he is the architecture, he's a colorist. Solon was the colorist for the exterior of Rockefeller Center. 
So all of those low relief sculptures that you see in Rockefeller Center designed by well-known sculptors like Lee Lowry, etc., were colorized by Solon. He's not known by anybody. I'm one of the few people who's written about him. I first discovered him many, many, many years ago and wrote a small <coughs> article on him. But he's typical of these color revolutionaries in that they did these high profile um, commissions, that, but they've been forgotten. Their, their work has been overshadowed by that of more famous sculptors, etc. Can we go back to slide 14, please? The other person I wanted to talk about in this group, the other color <coughs> revolutionary is Joseph Urban, the uh, Viennese immigrant to the United States who colorized the New School uh, here in New York, the building that looks like a zebra um, that's in the New School. Uh, and he also was the colorist for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. It was described as a cotton candy, uh, either catastrophe or masterpiece, depending on who you uh, uh, asked. Okay, uh, two more uh, brief overviews before I segue into uh, our, the textile industry. Number 17, please. This guy is named Howard Ketchum. He also worked for DuPont in the 1920s, designing, managing their paint palette. And in 1935, he set up his own independent consulting firm called Howard Ketchum, Inc. He was in 30 Rock. He was in 30 Rock before it became a TV show. <laughs> so he had a color, he was probably the most famous um, color consultant of the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. If you were, um, if you were Pan Am and you wanted someone to help you redesign the interior of your planes and to come up with a color scheme, who did you hire? You hired Howard Ketchum. Howard Ketchum designed this color and this branding scheme for Pan Am. He had major clients. Um, his, major, his other major client included, number 18 please, included Bell Labs. Who remembers these phones? I had it, the same color. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, he worked, uh, Howard Ketchum in the 1950s, um, was a consultant for Bell Labs, and he uh, worked with Bell Labs uh, engineers as they were redesigning the Bell Model 500 phone for AT&T. This is the day when you rented your phone, as some of you may recall. Henry Dreyfus, the famous in consultant industrial designer, designed the shape of the exterior of these phones, but Ketchum designed the palette. Okay, so here again we have somebody who is having an impact on the way the world looks, but is really unknown. The final color revolutionary that I want to give a brief overview on is in slide 19. His name is Faber Buren. I love this picture, this is Faber Buren. Um, in 1963, um, he was, like Ketchum, a color consultant based in New York, and he served a range of clients. As you can see here, he's surrounded with all of the things that he's colorized. Okay? <coughs> Everything from the wooden desk to the plastic um, on the typewriter here, to the vacuum cleaner, to the roofing tiles, to the paints for Dutch Boy and other paint companies, to school um, to school desks. I had one of these when I was in second grade. Um, he was probably, um, if besides Ketchum in the post-war years, if you wanted advice on color and you were a, a Fortune 500 company, you called Faber Buren. Faber Buren's most notable experience, however, was the fact that he was a co color consultant to Condé Nast. And as a color consultant to Condé Nast publishers, he designed the palette for the house and garden color palette. So every September for several decades, from the 1950s through the 1980s, when the magazine stopped being published, the house and garden would have a September issue. And in the September issue, it would put forth a new palette that was designed by Faber Buren, uh, based on his research in home furnishings. This would be the house and garden palette. Uh, there was an extensive licensing program that went along with that, and if you were a manufacturer, you could sign up for the licensing program. 
It's Faber Buren, I believe, that's responsible for the avocado green refrigerator. <laughs> you remember avocado green, sunset gold, and um, uh, sienna brown. Those colors appear in the house and garden palette starting in the 1960s, and then they disseminate. But he was a really interesting guy. He used, when he was at Condé Nast, um, they used the computer very early on, starting in the 50s, and they gather information from clients um, of, of the magazine, <coughs> advertisers of the magazine, would send them information about popular colors, and he quantified the data and made his color predictions or his color forecasts that way. So before Pantone, there were people doing this kind of stuff, even in the days before the computer. So let me segue now into the major case study, because I think that'll give you some, it relates to the exhibit and it'll give you some sense of what the kind of stuff uh, that I think is fascinating and really illuminating about um, the way in which color has been developed and managed. Slide 20, please. I'm gonna spend the, uh, ooh, that's 21. Mm -hmm. Slide 20, there we go. Um, I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk um, talking about this woman. Um, she's not someone who's famous. You're not going to see her work exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art or at the Museum of Modern Art, but you will read about her um, in my book if you have a chance to buy it or take it out of the library. She is America's first professional mm -hmm. color forecaster. Her name is Margaret Hayden Rourke. Does the name Hayden Rourke sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. I see some nods here. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Hayden Rourke. Who's Hayden Rourke? Captain Bellows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was a sitcom in the late 60s called I Dream of Jeannie. And the sidekick of the main character was a guy named Captain Bellows. He was a Nassau doctor. And his name was Hayden Rourke. And he was her son. That's just a little trivia. A little trivia. She, however, was an actress. That's how she started off in life. What's exciting about this, um, this project is it really gave me access to all of these interesting people and to all of these, um, all this history about the city of New York and the industry that went on here and, and the creative economy that went on in this city. Let me tell you a little bit about Margaret Hayden Rourke. She was born in Brooklyn. Well, I know she had one son, Hayden Rourke, who went on to Hollywood to be in a sitcom. She started life as an actress. I don't know much about her career. She was a stage actress, and I'm learning more now since I published the book. She may have been in early films that were made here in New York, and I, that's something that would be fun to explore. I have not done that. Um, she was also a suffragette. She um, wrote a suff suffrage pamphlet and campaigned for women to get the vote. So she was really quite a liberated woman for her time. And you can see she's quite the fashionista as well. She's really very elegant and, and very charming. So the story that I want to tell you about Margaret Hayden Rourke, to just give you an executive summary before I go into the details, focuses on her career with an organization that was the first color forecasting organization in the United States. It has a long convoluted name. It's called. Ready? The Textile Color Card Association of the United States. Told you. It produced this artifact, <laughs> which you're welcome to look at later. And it produced this artifact, which I'm going to pass around. These are mine, so you can maul them as much as you want. Fine, they're not museum artifacts. <coughs> um, the Textile Color Card Association, it still exists. It has a different name. It's now called the Color Association of the United States. And it is, still exists and it still does color standards and color forecasting for a variety of industries. It, I focus on it in the book. I focus on the organization in its cable. I focus on it in the 19 teens and 1930s and 1950s when Margaret Hayden Rourke was managing director. So she was managing director from 1918 to 1954. I'm going to talk about 1918 to 1939. And I think you get the gist of what this organization was doing. Can I have slide 21, please? Now, you know, recently Pantone issued uh, its color forecast 
for 1913. Uh, excuse me, 1913. <laughs> Keep doing that. Keep doing that. Issued his color forecast for 2013, and it said emerald green is the new black for 2013. Emerald green is the hot new color for 2013. And so what Pantone's in the business of doing is really in the business of selling um, its uh, color forecast and color standards to other businesses. And as part of promoting itself, it issues these extravaganzas at the end of the year to create excitement about its products. Now, Pantone did not invent the business of creating color standards and creating color forecasts. That has been around for a while. Um, the French actually invented color forecasts in the 19th century. But it's really the Textile Color Card Association that really perfects the business of color forecasting in the 19 teens. 20s and 30s, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Along comes World War I. In World War I, milliners, as you see here, slide 22 please, silk manufacturers, like the ones you see here, 23 please, shoe and leather manufacturers, 24 please, and retailers. These are really dark, I'm sorry. Uh, they're not, I think that's, it's the, it's the lighting situation here. Um, and retailers are, uh, can I have slide 26? Are uh, aghast. World War I has broken out in August of, in Europe, in August of 1914. And these industries, millinery, leather, um, Silk um, garment manufacturing, shoe manufacturing are gassed because, lo and behold, they can no longer get color forecasts from Paris. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a color card. And what I'm passing around is also a color card. In, in the 1870s, the French textile industry um, introduced these types of um, artifacts, which as you can see are flosses of silk, arranged in color, okay, so you've got dark purple, light purple, dark red, light red to yellow. Um, they issue these, um, the textile industry starts issuing these color cards. What are these color cards and who creates them? They were created in, starting in the 1870s by dye houses in the textile industry of Lyon and other, uh, Malouze and other textile centers in France to market dyeing services to the textile mills. So a dye house would say, uh, you issue this card and say, we have studied the latest fashions amongst the couture houses in Paris, and we believe that these colors are the colors that are gonna be in season for um, spring of 1896. This is how we can produce the colors, and we can guarantee the quality, and so on and so forth. So what ends up happening is that these tools, these color cards are created as business-to-business -business tools from dye houses to textile mills in France. And eventually, somebody figures out that they can buy these and sell them, and sell them as color forecasts. They are widely exported from France to England and to North America. So if you were a textile mill in Connecticut in 1900, and you are designing um, silk fabrics or wool fabrics or mostly silk fabrics, um, where would you get your fashion ideas? Well, you'd walk down, uh, you'd come to New York and you'd check out the market in New York, but you'd get quicker information if you got the color cards. So there evolved a business where importers here in Lower Manhattan would import these color cards and sell them to the textile and garment trade. So all of those those garment mills over there, those are a little later, but all of those garment mills over there would have had a supply of these as they, um, to the designers to keep on hand to use as reference tools. These were sort of, the, these were the, this was, this was the Pantone color swatch of the 1870s and 18, and up through the 19 teens. Along comes World War I, the American fashion industry can no longer get these color cards. 
So what happens? Slide 27. A group of men, and they are men, from the millinery, textile, shoe, leather, and garment, and retailing industries band together and they create this organization, the Textile Color Card Association of America. And they say, of all things, we are going to create an American card. We are going to create American colors for the American market. We want independence from Paris. <laughs> we are going to make an American palette. And they do it. They create, um, slide uh, 28 please, they create an American um, color palette. This is from 1914, and this is from 1915. Um, that is um, designed for the American market. Now, you have to remember that uh, in addition to not being able to color cards, the American textile industry can, cannot get imported German dyes at this point in time. The German dyes are the best dyes in the world, and they are used widely by the textile industry. The American dye industry is in infancy. It's just getting started. You can't really produce um, dyes of the intense colors of the intensity that the German Germans can produce. So you can see that there are some kind of like oddball colors here <laughs> going on, oddball schemes going on in 1914 and 1915. But the point is that these are, quote unquote, American colors for the American people. Okay. Now how does this work? The Textile Color Card Association is a membership organization. It's not a consumer organization. It's for businesses to belong to. So if you're a textile mill, you might pay a certain fee and you get this color standard. And you um, would use it to order your uh, fabrics. So if you were a garmento, and you were making ladies' blouses, you would uh, write, you would cable or telephone your cloth supplier and you'd say, give me red number 442 on the TCCA card. You'd call your button supplier and you'd say, give me red number 2242 to match. The problem here is trying to get things to match. And it seems kind of insignificant, but if you're making garments and you're making them in quantity, you're making shoes and you're making them in quantity, you want the materials to match. So th these are designed as business tools. But they're designed as business tools to be specific to the American market. Now how does Mrs. Rourke fit in? 29 please. Well these uh, fellows, who are very nice fellows, go along pretty well from 1914 to 1918. And then about 1918 or 1919 they start to scratch their head and say, I think we need to bring a woman on board. They literally say this. They want, um, there's, it's very popular in the 19-teens and 1920s um, for businesses to hire um, professional women, um, white collar uh, professionals, um, to bring the woman's viewpoint into the firm. This is absolutely characteristic if you're in any kind of fashion business, if you're in home appliances, if you're in glassware, a Corning Glassworks, for example, in the 1920s brought in a home economist named Lucy Maltby in the late 1920s who helped them redesign the Pyrex line. So Margaret Hayden Rourke was brought on board to bring in the woman's viewpoint. Uh, she did a terrific job. Um, slide 30. She came on board in 1918 just as the uh, garment industry was taking off. Now we had ready-to-wear manufacturing here in the United States all the way back to the 19th century, but it was really World War I that saw the enormous growth of the garment industry. And then of course in the 1920s you've got the whole move uptown, which is documented in the exhibit behind you. So you've got enormous growth of ready-to-wear. As garments become simpler, they become um, easier to produce on the assembly line and uh, there's a whole new uh, uh, spurt of energy in the 1920s. Uh, slide 31. How does Mar Margaret Hayden Rourke approach this? Well, the first thing she says, which not the first thing, she gets her feet wet and she kind of goes along with the techniques that have been established by the guys in the TCCA, but along about the early 1920s, she says, hmm, 
this thing of ignoring Paris has really got to go. <laughs> There's a lot happening in Paris, and we've got a whole new generation of couturiers, especially the female couturiers like Coco Chanel, who by the mid-1920s are introducing new styles and new fashions that are less formal than the um, pre-war couturiers and that have a lot of great design ideas that could not necessarily be copied by, for the American market, but adapted for the American market. So what she does is she says, we've got to look to Paris. Um, page thir uh, number 32. <laughs> Paris is particularly important not only because of the couture market, because, but because of the ready-to-wear market. And it's a source of design inspiration. Um, here you see an ensemble from the F FIT Museum. It's a knitted outfit, um, it's a skirt, a top, a scarf, and a hat. And as you can see, it's color coordinated um, with the blues and the grays and the um, navy blues. What happens in the 1920s is out of Paris is that these couturiers, the female designers, introduce the idea of the ensemble. They introduce the idea of the sort of sporty, casual outfit that has mix and match components. And what's missing from this mannequin, unfortunately, which is a great mannequin, but what's missing is the gloves, the shoes, the belt, and uh, all the other accessories that would have matched. Okay. Uh, can I go to slide 33, please? Margaret Hayden Rourke plays an enormous role in introducing the concept of the ensemble to the American uh, fashion business. So you have to remember that the fashion business at this point in time, it's not just ready to wear. Ready to wear is important, but it includes this whole host of supplemental industries like hats, gloves, leather, hosiery. It's those customer, it's those types of businesses that are the principal consumers of color forecasting, the color forecasts that the Texto Color Card Association makes. Okay, does that make sense? So, so in the 1920s, no respectable woman, whether she was uh, living on uh, Upper West Side or living on the Lower East Side, would have gone out of the house on a Saturday or certainly on Sunday to go walking without a hat, gloves, and shoes that matched in some sort of way. Now, Stacy and Clinton make fun of this now. They call it matchy-matchy. But um, back in those days, it was you had a whole different culture, and you had this culture of respectability. And it was very important for women to present themselves in a certain way and in order to achieve middle class, um, middle, aspire to be a member of the middle class, or if you were upper class, to show that you were um, a woman of, uh, of wealth and taste. So what Margaret Hayden Rourke does is she builds her career around this idea of the ensemble. And she builds her career promoting the idea of matching uh, bits and pieces of the outfit. Now how does she do this and how does she get information from Paris that enables her to do this? Slide 34, please. You have to put yourself back in time and um, think back to the mid-1920s and ask yourself the question, if you were a garmento or if you were a textile mill or if you were a leather manufacturer, how are you going to get information from Paris? Okay. How are you going to get it and how are you going to get it in time for you to make goods so that they'll be fashionable? How can you make the goods in the right colors before the imports from Paris appear in port and then appear in the B. Altman window. Okay, so it's a matter of timing here. So how are you gonna do that? Well, here we see the invention of the color scout or the fashion scout. Margaret Hayden Rourke, starting in the 1920s, um, secured funding from the board of directors to hire fashion scouts to work for her in Paris. So the first, she had um, three, three, three different fashion scouts that I've studied from 1925 up until 1939. The first fashion scout was Adelaide Cardinet, 
and Adele Cardenet. And Adele Cardenet was a, California, was a French descent. She was born in California, but she was fluent in French. And she went to Paris um, in the 19 teens and set up a career working for a commissionaire, working for a business that represented American companies in Paris. And she learned the ropes. And um, then in the 1920s, she set up her own business representing um, textile and fashion companies um, in, in Paris. And so what Cardinet would do is that she would basically be stationed in Paris. She had a staff of women who worked for her. Uh, she and the women would hobnob in the right circles. They would go to the couture openings. They would check out the scene. They would go shopping, much like a color scout does, a, a scout or a fashion scout does today. And they would cable, they would send information back to Margaret Rourke. This is a letter from 1925 that, from Cardinet to Rourke. And she sent pictures, it's hard to see, but these are pictures of two very, very wealthy um, Parisian women, uh, European women, showing the latest hats. Now, the concern here is the hats, which are hard to see in the picture. But they're the latest hats and the latest colors. Could I have um, slide 35? Cardinet would also send sketches of the latest, um, of the latest fashions and cables. So before you had the internet, and before you had a transcontinental telephone, you could use the telegraph to get information across the Atlantic in a very, very quick way. And that's what Cardinet did. Now, um, turns out Rourke was dissatisfied with Cardinet because um, she felt that Cardinet's um, descriptions of color were inaccurate and that she didn't have a really good uh, fashion sense. For example, we all know that Coco Chanel introduced the little black dress in the mid-1920s. Nowhere in any of Cardinet's report is the little black dress mentioned. <laughs> so she was not um, maybe up to snuff in terms of her ability to uh, scope out the scene. What, uh, 36 please? Work then hired this woman, who is just a fascinating uh, person. Her name is Bettina Bedwell. And Bettina Bedwell was a journalist. She was an American. She was a journalist, uh, born in the Midwest. She uh, went to Paris as a young woman in the early 1920s, and she lived there until 1939. She was married to um, an artist named Abraham Ratner. Ratner was in the same circles as Picasso and Moreau, although he was not revered as much as they are today. But he was an artist of that, of that generation and of that circle. She worked as a journalist for the Herald Tribune, and she wrote a fashion column for the Herald Tribune. So if you went to the New York Public Library, we could still go to the New York Public Library, and looked at old issues of the New York Herald, of the Herald Tribune, you would find her column, her weekly column. She also designed patterns for women, and you could buy Bettina Bedwell patterns from the Herald Tribune. So if you were in, um, in Europe, and you were English speaking in the 1920s, you read the Herald Tribune because it was written in English for English speaking people who were living in Europe. So her column was read widely by English speaking people all over Europe. What did she do for Rourke? She was a color scout for Rourke. And, and what does that mean? Um, let's see now. She pretty much did the same kinds of things that um, that, um, that Cardinet did, but she was better at it. She was able to, she was uh, trained as a fashion designer, she had an acute color sense, and she was very good at describing colors. Can we go to slide 39, please? These, slide, yeah. This is uh, one of her letters from 1936. Did I drop something? One of her letters from slide 36. Uh, 1936, and swatches that she sent um, to bet to um, New York. As you can see, this is um, these were bigger swatches that probably came out to here, and they've been snipped um, by um, by uh, Margaret Hayden Rourke. So these are swatches from the Scaparelli showroom in 1936. So Bedwell, because she was a journalist, had entree into. Into the, into the couture houses. She had a press pass, and she could go to the couture shows, which were closed off from, um, 
the uh, public and she could get advance information. So what she would do is she would send a tell, she would go to a couture show and she would say, um, Scaparelli is showing purple, uh, which it, she'd see that Scaparelli was showing purple. She would then cable Rourke overnight saying, Scaparelli is showing purple much like your purple number 446 on the 1926 color card. And then she'd send these letters with the swatches, which would be in New York within 10 days. So Rourke was getting information literally 10 days after the show. And she would take this information and she would um, integrate it into a new type of product <laughs> called the color forecast. Can I have slide 41? So, oh, that slide again. But this is an advanced color forecast from 1933. So in addition to having this large uh, color card, which uh, offered the standard colors, Rourke introduced the concept built on the French tradition of color forecasting and introduced the idea of the seasonal forecast. So you'd have standard colors that would be in fashion for um, seven to 10 years, and these would be your basic colors. And then in order to keep up with the trends, you'd have these seasonal forecasts that were circulated to members. So this is, and these were issued in the spring and fall. They were issued for textiles, they were in, separate one for textiles, a special one for hosiery. I think you have the hosiery one that's going around. A separate one for wool, a separate one for silk, and so on. A separate one for leather, and so on and so forth. So, uh, can I have slide 43? So, in conclusion, Margaret Hayden Rourke was really the pioneer of American color forecasting. She um, was um, one of, she was not mentioned in, Fortune, in the Fortune magazine article. She was not identified as a color revolutionary because I think that uh, Fortune was not looking to the garment industry. It was looking more towards uh, uh, consumer durables in its article on color industry. But she uh, played an important role and she was um, certainly within the same network as people like um, uh, H. Ledger Toll and Joseph Urban and uh, Leon Solon and uh, Howard. <coughs> so um, her legacy really is, uh, is the fact that we have colors that match, that we have, um, we have Pantone, uh, which is not started until the 1950s or 1960s, essentially doing the same thing that the Textile Color Card Association did but adapting it to the modern era using computer technology and very, very sophisticated uh, chemical technology to produce the colors. But this business of, of having standardized colors and having colors that match and having colors that change every season is really a product of this moment in American modern history um, when there was a desire to get a hold of the material world and to shape it and to make it more efficient and more fashionable. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Were there mavericks in this color uh, mm -hmm. arena where they didn't go along with these standard colors and try to maybe break the rules, so to speak? Yes, there were, um, all, that's what's fascinating about this uh, whole story, is because um, compliance is really, how do you get, uh, clearly not everybody is wearing, like, not everybody's wearing emerald green, here it is 2013, and we're not all wearing emerald green, because Pantone has told us to wear emerald green. And this is, of course, the case even back in uh, 100 years ago, or uh, 90 years ago, is how do you get people to comply? This is a voluntary, uh, it's an organization, and you, you use, you're a manufacturer, you're, you use this tool as you see fit. You are not obligated to use this tool. And to answer your question more directly, yes, there are people who reject this whole concept. And those people are right up here, some of those people are right up here on Fifth Avenue. The big department stores on Fifth Avenue don't want anything to do with this. They want to set their own colors. They want to create, um, Bergdorf wants to create windows full of merchandise that's distinctive. 
Altman's wants merchandise that's distinctive. This is all just mass market stuff, you know, for the people on 34th Street. And in fact, there are these great um, quotes where Margaret Hayden Rourke goes out and she's able to um, convince the, the stores on 34th Street to buy into her Gimbals and Macy's, et cetera, to buy into the system. But the department stores on Fifth Avenue will not because back in those days, it was very, very high pollutant. You know, all of them, all the way down to Lord and Taylor, would not go along with this system. And so there is resistance and um, so part of, the, you know, part of establishing a brand for a department store or for a certain product would be to create a distinctive color palette. It's something that didn't go along with this. Uh, another good example here in New York of Mavericks is, um, is the New York World's Fair of 1939. And I didn't bring my slide of those colors, but um, they didn't want anything to do with Margaret Hayden Rourke and the Color Association initially because they thought it was too lowbrow and wanted to create, and they didn't want anything to do with uh, Howard Ketchum. Howard Ketchum <coughs> sued the, sued the um, New York World's Fair because Howard Ketchum in, 1930, in the late 1930s went to the World's Fair Corporation and made a proposal for colorizing the fair. And uh, war broke out in 1939 and they lost his plans or something. <laughs> and, um, it, they ended up uh, hiring some muralists and some architects to colorize the fair, and he sued them because he felt that um, they, he had been you know, brushed aside and they'd copied some of his ideas. Um, so, so I think you know, there's a lot of tensions in this revolution. It's not, it's not that everybody goes along with the game plan, and you know, it, I think it shows that you can't, you, the world is full of variety, endless variety. You can't, despite the fact that American industry has this reputation for making mass-produced, standardized goods that all look alike, they really, there really is a world of difference in American industry at that point in time. I would think, too, that World War II, yeah. everything kind of ceased. Yes. It wasn't until late 40s, early 50s, when you began seeing the two-tone cars. Yes. Yes, you do, and that's a whole nother, that's another story that I talk about in the book. I talk about the two-tone cars and how they come about, and it doesn't have anything to do with Margaret Hayden Rourke, but um, it has to do with the new paint technologies that come along, and two-tone cars are actually kind of a flop because dealers hate them, because it's too hard to manage the inventory of two-tone cars. Same thing with two-tone refrigerators and two-tone stoves. Dealers hate them. And so when colored appliances come out in pastels in the 1950s, um, appliance dealers, some appliance dealers, depending on the part of the country, some appliance dealers relish them and really push them, but a lot of them complain and start pulling out their hair and saying, you know, well, this lady's going to get her stove part, you know, in front of her stove's going to get dented, and how am I going to get our new panel two years from now? And so it's a, a lot of this kind of stuff is like practical stuff, you know, practical problems uh, limit the diffusion of this kind of um, color standardization. You know, same thing with two-tone cars, dealers just pull out their hair on those two-tone or three-tone cars and they don't want to carry them. It's just, and it ends up being a nightmare for everybody and that's why they go out of business. That's why they got a style. It's not because the style Henry changes. Henry Ford had it right. Any color you want as long as it's black. Yeah, well, he was given a run for his money by General Motors though and, and H. Ledger told. <laughs> yes? Um, I, you know, I'm looking at the color palettes. I have two questions. First of all, they seem so big. Yeah. I'm surprised. I would think that the palette would be much more limited because the, the range is just massive yeah. here, yeah. number one. Yeah. And number two, the way they're organized, yeah. some of them are organized in variations of colors, almost like a rainbow pattern. Yeah. And then they start jumping from color to color to color. Yeah. And it, so it's not making logical sense to me. How this, is a war, this, is a 19, this is a wartime palette. This is from the 1940s. So this was um, produced in from 1941, so you're in part, I'm gonna, I can pick it up and pass it around, I'm having problems with people looking at it. The um, other palettes were kind of similar too, very large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, what happens is there are two things that go on. There's, this is a standard, okay? So they start off um, creating, they're just gonna have like a, a one color card, and it's gonna be the forecast and the standard. And then they realize that they have to have two things. They have to have a standard 
and then they have to have the forecast, so they break them down. So th this is a palette of colors that will be available, uh, predicted to be available for 7 to 15 years. And so, okay, and so these are like the basics. So when you go to Macy's and you buy, I want a sweater in black, you go to get a basic, basics. These are the basics. And then the other little, little cards like this, these are the forecasts, and these are the more high fashion colors. Okay? So these are sort of like what they carry, what the, what the companies carry that you can work with. Yeah. Like yeah. This is what the designer can work with. And then they want to be a little more edgy, they use these forecasts. Yeah, right. Okay? That makes sense. Okay. And so, and then why do they jump to at the end? They, 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 jump from, yeah, they just jump from color to color instead um, of going from the, the subtle variations. Yeah, I think that this is just um, these are just different different count. I don't um, I don't know the answer. Probably added. There probably was oh, a thirty nine oh, no. she added them. Oh. It's also during the war, so there's some yeah. impact of the right. war there, and right. it's what she could do, what she couldn't do. I think. Right. It's Forty one. Any other questions? I have some practice. Yes. How, I mean, this research that you've been doing, yeah. where did you, I mean, it looks oh. like you went everywhere and you did. <laughs> I had this idea when I started the book that I was going to do everything. <laughs> I was going to do the world. <laughs> and so I, um, you know, because there's a lot of pressure now for scholars. You have to be global, and you have to be multicultural, and you have to do uh, big picture things. And I went to Paris, and I did research in Paris and archives, and I went to London, and I did research in the v &A. And this is our part of done research in the US. And I um, ended up not focusing I ended up focusing on the United States because I found that what I saw in the United States in the modern period that was happening from the 19-teens until the 1970s, I wasn't seeing anywhere else. Okay? And why is that? It's, this is not an American chauvinistic perspective, but America had emerged from World War I standing. It emerged from World War II standing. In the 20s and in the 50s and 60s, we had the largest consumer economy in the world. And we had the largest industrial economy in the world. And so this phenomenon of trying to manage the world of consumer products was an outgrowth of that dominance. And you know, when I say that this is an American phenomenon, and I've been accused of being chauvinistic because of this, but I tried to make the point that this is not chauvinistic, that there's a reason to look at America. So I went to a lot of different archives. I went to, in the United States, I used materials here at the New York Public Library, the World's Fair papers. I used um, materials at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware, which has the DuPont archives. I used GM materials and Ford materials in Michigan. I've used textile mill papers from New England. I mean, it, I didn't write this, I didn't just sit down one day and write the book and go straight through, but it was about 10 years altogether between other books and other projects. And, you know, I've written a lot of books, so this went on for, dragged on for a while. And then after a while, you just sit down and say, I've got to write it. <laughs> so I, I went through a lot of sources. The one thing that's really useful for doing this kind of work is um, trade journals, trade and industry journals. So I read a lot of, um, and Carol, you've probably done this with the architecture as well. You just sit there in the library and you read the journals of the textile industry on a page-by-page -page basis and you learn an incredible amount. You can't skim them, you can't, there's no indexes for them, you actually have to read them. And is this the standard card, color card, do they have their own archives? They do, actually, they do, and that was going to, thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of the great finds that I um, landed on very early in the project was finding the archives of this organization and that kind of, um, so like any historical project, the project I think should be shaped by the archives. And so very early on I found their archives, their archives are at Hagley. And what's distinctive about this archive is it's not just the color cards, because you can find a lot of color cards. There, you know, the Cooper Hewitt has a huge collection of color cards. What's distinctive is that you have the correspondence 
between Rourke and her Paris agents. That's distinctive. And you've got the other thing that's distinctive is you've got the minutes of the executive committee and the different color committees. And they're transcribed. There's a stenographer sitting there taking notes, and the conversations are transcribed. And there are full runs of these from the 20s and 30s. And that's what makes this archive particularly rich. You know, we know if we study the fashion business that Paris had some kind of influence. But I'm interested in, in saying more than that. I want to know how the information got across the ocean. And this archive enabled me to do that. It enabled me to paint a little picture of, um, you know, a little tiny part of the world. This is how information got from Paris to New York. And this is how it was integrated, or not integrated, into our material culture. So that's a really important question, is the sources. Yes. Um, throughout your presentation, you referred to uh, choices that were made for the American market. Yes. How would you characterize, what was it, you know, how would you characterize the American market at yes. this time? Yes, that's very, that's another um, interesting question, and I, I addressed that in the book. And I think maybe the best way to address that is to compare, uh, to, com to draw on comparisons that were made by Bedwell and Rourke, comparing the women in Paris and the women in New York, the women, American, Parisian women versus uh, American women. It was American uh, women, uh, it was believed, and again, we're, we can only talk about people's perceptions. We can't, there's no way we're ever going to sort of know. Um, it was believed that American women uh, liked bright colors. Maybe we should go to one of these slides. Mm -hmm. um, we could go to uh, slide nine. It was believed um, beginning nine. Oh, you can't really see it. Um, beginning in slide, can you see the bright colors? Somewhat. It was be beginning in the 1870s, um, when the new synthetic dyes came out, American women had a reputation for liking bright colors. It was said that American women liked to put together outfits that had punch. Okay? That they, um, French women, on the other hand, it was believed had, and English women especially, had more subtle tastes. Okay? If we could go to, then we can get this slide to demonstrate the idea better. Let's see. We go to, and part of the problem is the lights on behind me. Go to slide 38. Um, in the 1930s, Bedwell um, went shopping around Paris, and part of her duties is a color scout. And um, she noticed that um, French women liked plain stockings, plain beige stockings, but that American women like bright colored stockings. Can you just turn the light off a little bit? Oh. So if you look at this ad for an American stocking mill based in Philadelphia, you'll see some of these bright colored stockings here, okay? And in the, the Blue Moon Lady. Um, it was believed by the Parisians um, that Bedwell was, um, was intersecting with that French women would never wear these bright colors. Some of these bright colored stockings were imported to Paris and they were, they were put in window displays as teasers, but they were not, they never really gained popularity. It's a, but in America, women apparently love these bright colored stockings. If you go to the PMA, <laughs> Philadelphia Museum of Art, you will see in their collections, lime green and pale pink silk stockings designed by Elsa Schiaparelli for the American market. So, the point that I'd like to make is that we hear a lot about multiculturalism today, but you have to remember that America in the 1920s was also a multicultural society. You had Polish Americans, Italian Americans, Jewish Americans, um, all kinds of people from all over the world coming to America, bringing with them a love of bright colors and peasant costumes and so on and so forth. And that is integrated even though they may have dressed in goods that made them look ladylike, they still loved color. And so I think that that comes out in the, that reality 
comes out in the narrative by looking through color. So, to executive summary, American women have, it's more multicultural, and because it's more multicultural, there's an interest in brighter colors okay. than in Europe. And I don't know, I mean, you can't really, I can't compare it to Asia or I saw so I think if we have additional questions, maybe we could ask okay. them individually because we have red, white, and rosé wine for reception <laughs> afterwards. So we have the, have the spectrum. I can invite you to uh, take a look at the book and ask Reggie an individual question if you like. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.